wisdom. Stand aright. Let us listen to the Holy Gospel. Peace be with all. And with your spirit. A reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory be to you. At that time, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they, come, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Slave Jesus Christ. Glory be to Jesus Christ. I would like to welcome Father Warren and Father Jack, Father Warren's brother-in-law. Uh, it is wonderful to have uh, both of you priests here present with us today. Thank you for coming. I actually met uh, Father Jack on our Jesus Prayer pilgrimage up the mountain of prayer. Uh, a number of years ago, actually, now. I think it's been a while. Uh, and it's so good to have you here with us, Father. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, we, we won the lottery. I don't know if we won the lottery. I, I, I don't believe we won the lottery, but I do believe that the Lord works uh, in incredible ways. Uh, and uh, every seventh year, obviously, because of the seven days of the week, we get to encounter this feast on a Sunday. So it's the transfiguration of our Lord. And it happens to fall on a Sunday, which is incredible uh, and wonderful. And it reminds us of the destiny of humanity. In other words, it answers the question, what is it all about and what is it for? I'm sure you've heard the, ex the, uh, the statement before, it's not the journey that matters or sorry, it's not the, the, uh, the, the destination that matters, it's the journey that matters. This is kind of a paraphrase of, of Emerson, a uh, famous American philosopher. It's not the destination that matters, it's the journey that matters. Well, brothers and sisters, I would propose to you this morning that that's a bunch of nonsense, or at least not fully the truth. It is the destination, in fact, that gives meaning to the journey. I think that the point of that, uh, that, point of that uh, phrase is to make sure we enjoy the journey more than we are, but in order to enjoy that journey, we've got to know where we're going. We've got to know the point, right? We've got to know uh, the destination. That's what allows the journey to make any sense in the first place. And today, in this feast, we are given that destination. What is it all about? What's it all for? What does it all mean, essentially, as Christians? Well, our Lord takes Peter, James, and John up a mountain. Maybe we can understand this a little bit better living in Calgary, where we have mountains within view. Why do we climb mountains? To get to the top. This is what it's about, right? We see these mountains and we say, I wonder what's up there. I wonder what it looks like from up there. I wonder what the top looks like. This is the point. We see these mountains, and we want to get to the top. There's a yearning and a desire in our hearts to summit that, to figure out what is up there. 
And so mountains, brothers and sisters, work on us in this incredible, deep psychological way in this desire. They've always been, and they always will be, a perfect analogy for prayer. When you see icons in, or sorry, when you see mountains in iconography, like this one back here, we're meant to understand prayer, prayer. Our Lord takes these three disciples, Peter, James, and John, up the mountain, set apart, to pray. This is the point. And mountains are a great analogy for that because they bring you to heaven, right? They bring you to the sky. They bring you closer to a spot where you're going to meet the Lord. Your perspective changes. Seeing the world from up there puts things in a different order, in a different place. And it gets more difficult as you climb, right? Beginning a mountain adventure down at the, at the base, that's pretty easy. It's all of a sudden when the pitch changes, when the ground that you're walking on starts to be a little bit more loose, you start to slide back a little bit more, it gets more difficult. What's well, the same thing with our spiritual lives, brothers and sisters? It doesn't just stay uniform. It gets more difficult as we climb to the top. But it's worth it, because at the top, brothers and sisters, we find the Lord. Well, what can we learn from this incredible feast? A couple things. Number one, something that is often overlooked, and that is that God isn't fair. God isn't fair. Not at least in the way we would think. Right? He takes three disciples, Peter, James, and John, and he separates them from the rest and says, let's go up the mountain to pray. That word, by the way, it wasn't, it wasn't just simply they happened to be there at that moment. And so he took them. He specifically chose them. He took them. It's the same word that we use in Greek for take, eat. This is my body in the Eucharist. He specifically chooses these three disciples. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The Lord knows, right? I've got some, some pretty good ideas as far as why. But the point is, is that it's up to the Lord. It's the Lord's choosing. Now, someone looking in at that can say, well, that's not fair, right? Why wasn't Andrew the first called taken, right? Why wasn't Mary Magdalene the first to see the Lord's resurrection taken? Why, why not? And we just, brothers and sisters, have to rely on the fact that the Lord has his purposes. The Lord is the one who decides these things. And it's not fair. On the other side of that equation, we can thank God that he's not fair. Because of, if there's anything that isn't fair, it's the fact that a righteous, sinless man should die for the sins of the world. The Lord is completely unfair. He does not give us what we deserve, and we should be grateful for that. And so we see that God isn't fair in his choosing of these three disciples. We do know that Peter will become the chief disciple, right? We do know that he will write, as we just read in the epistle today, that he has seen this. He'll be strengthened by this in order to do exactly what he says. The Lord has shown me how to take off this tent of mine, right? I'm going to take off this tent. The time is coming soon where I'll take off this tent. He will die as a martyr for the Lord. He will be strengthened in seeing the Lord's crucifixion and also in following in the steps of martyrdom. James will be the first to die as a martyr of the disciples for the Lord. He will be strengthened through this event. And St. John, the theologian, will write an incredible gospel that will bring us closer to the Lord. The Lord had his reasons for revealing this incredible mystery to these specific three disciples. Was it fair? No. And thank God for that. That's number one. God isn't fair. Number two, the Lord is the fulfillment of of a long history of the Lord with his people. The greatest story ever told, the Lord Jesus is the culmination of that. Who do we see in this feast on his right and his left? Well, Moses and Elijah, 
right? Moses and Elijah, two incredible men of prayer. Moses received the law and the commandments. He was speaking to the Lord to such an extent that when he came down off the mountain, if you recall the story, his face was so bright he needed to veil it because people were going blind looking at him. Okay? Elijah, on the other hand, had a very different experience. He was on his run, uh, on, a, on a run for his life from Jezebel, right, who was out to kill him. And he's hiding in the mountain. He sees a huge fire go th- before him, an earthquake, mighty winds. And it isn't until he gets quiet enough to hear the still, small voice of the Lord that he has this incredible encounter with our Lord. And so we see here, in this feast, the culmination, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Right? Moses for the law and Elijah for the prophets. It gets better. We see also the culmination of the living and the dead. Moses died on the mountain, not entering into the Holy Land. Remember, he struck the rock out of anger. He did it in a way that the Lord didn't bless. He wasn't allowed into the Holy Land because of that. He died on the mountain. But Elijah was taken up into heaven in a fiery chariot without dying. We have here the fulfillment, the culmination of the living and the dead. But beyond that, we have an incredible culmination of the fact that both Moses and Elijah had an incredible encounter with this man who is speaking to them, the Lord, the God-man Jesus, on the mountain themselves. Moses saw the glory of the Lord from the back. Remember, he saw his back as he passed by. Elijah, I already mentioned, had that encounter in the still small voice. And here, the disciples are given something incredible. And that is, the God of the universe become a man and dwelling among us. And so we can't help but say what Peter says, right? Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let me make a tent for Moses and for Elijah and one for you. In other words, Let's just move right in. Let's just live here forever, right? I don't want to give this up. They encountered something, not of just simply intuiting or reading or having a hint of who the Lord is, but encountering the Lord in a person, in a man. The truth of the Lord shining forth, the God-man, the creator of the universe, who is there speaking to them and revealing his glory as the the God of the universe. An incredible encounter, something that Moses and Elijah did not experience. Well, brothers and sisters, it gets even better than that. And that is that we are made in God's image and likeness. We are made in order to be in communion with him forever and to become God's by grace, to become God's by grace. We have a fancy word for that in Greek, theosis. Theosis means to become what it is that we were always meant to be, and that is united with Christ and to become God-like, to become God's by grace, not by nature. Jesus is God by nature, right? He is God from eternity. We are called to grow into his likeness, and to become so incredibly amazing through that contact that we become gods by grace, theosis. This is our destiny, right? Mountains make no sense without the top. Journeys make no sense without the destination. Well, today, in this feast, brothers and sisters, we're given the destination. This is where we're headed. Imagine living our whole lives not knowing where it is that we're going, what it is that we're doing. I remember Father Peter Galadza, when I was uh, doing my formation in Ottawa at the Sheptitsky Institute, would always pray for those who do not know what they believe. And I didn't get it at the time. Like, why are we praying for those who who don't know what they believe? But absolutely, it's necessary to live our lives not knowing what it is that we believe, to live our lives not knowing where it is that we are going, is a life that makes no sense. When we recognize that, yes, there is a top to this mountain, 
And yes, it is a mountain worth climbing because of that amazing top, that amazing encounter we're going to receive with the Lord. That's what makes life, life, brothers and sisters. That's what makes it worth living. So what does it mean for us, practically speaking? How should the reading of this gospel change your life? Well, the first thing I would say is that you should never settle for anything short than theosis. Never settle for anything short than this incredible promise that the Lord has made to you. And that is you will become God's by grace. This is the point. That the Lord loves you enough to bring you out of the world and to be with Him forever. Nothing else that you are going to receive here is going to come anywhere close to satisfying that desire in your life. And the world has all sorts of substitutes for that, I promise you. You don't have to go far into this church, you know, before you will be promised something different. But wealth, popularity, sensual pleasure, financial benefit, whatever the case is, is never going to fill that hole. It is only ever going to be filled with this understanding that we are meant to be with the Lord forever. That's one. Never settle for anything less than theosis. Never ever. The second thing is, brothers and sisters, recognize that this destiny which is laid upon us in, informs our interpersonal interactions. To know that the person sitting next to you in the pews or that you meet somewhere else, whatever the case is, is going to spend eternity with you and with the Lord should change the way you interact. Should change the way you interact. Knowing that this is the destination, that we are arriving there together, really all of a sudden makes all of the gospel make sense. I was hungry and you, you, you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. If we're not willing to do that, brothers and sisters, because we think this is just a temporary measure, well, we're in trouble. Knowing the destination should influence the way we interact with one another. There's an incredible Christian writer, C.S. Lewis, who wrote something very pertinent to this that I'd like to share. This is in his famous homily called The Weight of Glory. This is what he wrote. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities that it, is, that it is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another, our friendships, our loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals with whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit, immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. And so, brothers and sisters, we have climbed this mountain with the Lord. We continue to climb up the mountain of prayer. We continue to struggle through this liturgy in order to encounter the Lord at the top of this mountain where we will receive the Eucharist today. His body and blood gifted to us. Let us continue to keep the destiny of our life in mind. Let us continue to strive for the, de for the destination that we are headed, unity with the Lord and Theosis. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Slava Jesus Christ. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory be to